Okay, so please be seated. We're going to close the curtain, so then we have a better acoustic. And before I, I introduce um, our first keynote speaker at Izmir, I would like to make a short announcement. And it's not the most pleasant announcement that I have to make, but we have security problems. So we had some laptops which have been stolen this morning, and a couple of, the, of them. So we are going to have more security to secure the place. And we should have two security guards at the entrance of, of, uh, of, the, of the building, not of the building, of the room, of the amphitheater. So please wear your badge at all times, because it's the only way for them to check that you are um, uh, one of uh, the Ismir attendees. Sorry for that, but then it's the only solution to be in a space which is secure and without being scared of having our laptop stolen. OK, so now to the more pleasant thing. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome you, uh, Patrick Flandrin, for our first keynote, our first keynote speaker at Ismir. It's a special uh, pleasure for me because Patrick was uh, one of my opponents in my PhD defense. So, um, well, it was not yesterday. But it's, uh, so it's a special pleasure for me. So Patrick is a, a very um, non-researcher. He has, um, he's, uh, he's a researcher in, uh, at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in, uh, in Lyon. But he has also received many uh, um, uh, awards. So uh, I'm going to uh, take my, uh, my laptop to not to forget any of them of those because there are quite a number of them. Maybe I will not list all of them, but at least the main one. So he has a prix Michel Montpetit from the Academy of Science of France. He's a fellow IEEE uh, since 2002. And he also uh, got uh, the silver medal from CNRS, one of the most famous distinctions that you can have in France. And uh, he's also the me a member of uh, the Academy of Science uh, since uh, 2010. Uh, so he's a very renowned researcher in France and, and uh, world uh, famous. And he's going to, um, to illustrate also with a specific year today, uh, this year I mean, because it's the 250th anniversary of Joseph Fourier. And I know that uh, in most of the work we are going to see at this conference, Fourier is more or less present, just because we use often uh, Fourier transform. And uh, so Patrick Flandre is going to give a talk in the spirit of uh, also to, to give a, a merit to uh, Fourier's work. And he's going to start his work maybe in the, 18th, in the 19th century, the beginning of the 19th century. And we are going to listen to quite old sounds, I think. So I, I will not say much more than that. I think we can give uh, Patrick Flandre a round of applause and uh, listen to his talk. Okay, thank you, Gael. Thank you very much for uh, the nice introduction and thank you for the invitation. In fact, I'm very pleased to be here for giving this talk uh, with this audience, which is not uh, exactly the community I am dealing with uh, every day, but I'm very pleased because there are a lot of possible interaction between the kind of research uh, I'm doing and the kind of applications you have as well. So wh what I will uh, do in this talk is something which is not really technical, and I just wanted uh, when I was proposed to, to give this talk, to precisely uh, talk about a little bit of Fourier, but more than Fourier, because that's a Fourier year, so it's important to celebrate Fourier because we have to remember that without Fourier, we would be, uh, we would have much more difficulties to do a lot of things that we do every day, but also to think about ideas which go around. Fourier, with or without Fourier, and uh, it will be more clear in, in, in the following. And this is more an historical perspective on some aspects, and hopefully with some echoes in what we are doing today and what we can imagine to do, and maybe it would be a, a way of thinking of different approaches to uh, problems, be they theoretical or, or practical, which are related to at at large audio signal processing. So everything starts with Fourier. So you know that Joseph Fourier now was born in 1768. So this is a 250th birthday this year. And 
Joseph Fourier was really an amazing character. He's one of the giants of science, even if it's not as famous in the large audience as, as it should. But Fourier is everywhere. But it's not only uh, the Fourier we know, it's also a much more complex character because it's a political figure. So I guess that most of you know that he played a major role in the French Revolution. He joined Bonaparte and especially he was a key member in the campaign which was in Egypt and back in France, he wrote a beautiful introduction to this, uh, to the book, which was uh, some kind of extremely large book related to the description of Egypt. And, and Fourier was instrumental in that, not only by writing the thing, but also by coordinating the efforts which have been made in Egypt. And after that, he was, of course, appreciated by Bonaparte, and he was made a préfet governor of the French province of Isère, where also he played a very important role of political administration and uh, running with new ideas, ideas related partly with science, especially introducing some statistical ideas in the way of dealing with water and things like this. And this was really a major activity for Fourier. But meanwhile, he was also a true scientist and a very distinguished scientist. And even when he was a governor, he, made, he conducted experiments, and this was during this period that he achieved what, she, what is his really major work, which is the theory of heat, and which eventually led to harmonic analysis. And there are two dates here, because even if the uh, experiments were conducted a little bit before, in uh, 1807, something like this, the first draft of the manuscript was submitted to the French Academy of Science in 1811, but it was only really published 11 years later for a number of reasons I will not explain here, but there was a, some kind of a gap in between the initial ideas and the publication. Nevertheless, he was recognized as a distinguished scientist and he was elected member of the French Academy of Sciences and he eventually became what we call secrétaire perpétuel, perpetual secretary of the academy, which is one of the highest position in the academy. And clearly, it was somebody who, at that time, has really a vision of science which is extremely modern as compared to what we are doing now. Not only because we have bright mathematicians who are doing uh, politics, but uh, also because he was really a father of, the, of what we call now the mathematical physics, making a bridge in between theories adapted to physical problems, creating new mathematics, and also some kind of vision of there was a need for having things computable. And at that time, it was far before computers, but it was really something which we could now, if he had the, 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 the means of achieving this program, which we call computational physics of, of computational mathematics. And Clearly, if you look at the Fourier, uh, the method that Fourier developed, they're really everywhere. And it's hard to find numbers, but uh, I heard uh, some day that every minute, something like one third of the, all the computation done on all the computers all over the world are just computing Fourier transforms. Because Fourier transforms are really in all the transforms which are used for coding, for communication, and for science and not only technology. Okay, so Fourier is really famous for this theory of heat and harmonic analysis, at least in our field. And the main claim, if we want to summarize, is just that any function can be represented as a superposition of sines and cosine. So this may sound a little bit uh, obvious now, but it was a long way for having something correct to say about this. And amazingly, uh, the theory of Fourier really emerged from the analysis of the heat problem. So how to write an equation for heat, and for that he, de he derived the correct mathematics, but he was n never really interested in other forms of things like vibration and acoustics, whereas it seemed to be a natural domain where to apply these ideas. In the, in the main treatise, there is one sentence at most, 
which said that the same kind of idea could be of great benefit to what Bernoulli tried to do. That's it. So it was just one, I think he was not interested in, in, uh, in, in things like acoustics, or maybe he had no time to, to do that. Whereas there had been a lot of effort before, precisely with guys like Bernoulli, D'Alembert, and Lagrange, and after. Because after, if you see the gap, I will come back to this a little bit later. Uh, let's say that the theory was known in 1822. Uh, you have to wait at least 20 years later before people's quote, in some sense, Fourier's work in some application, like, for example, Rome, and uh, we, in reference with the uh, acoustical physiology of, uh, uh, of uh, physiological acoustics of Helmholtz. Uh, I will come back to this later. So that's a little bit surprising that there is some kind of uh, absence of acoustics uh, in, in, in Fourier work. Okay, so now, in practice, uh, Fourier decomposition, I was telling you that Fourier was really uh, interested in having possible applications, concrete applications of his ideas, even if he had no re real ways to do that. And of course, later, there had been in the, in the 19th century and in the 20th century a lot of ways of putting Fourier decomposition in action. And I quote this uh, famous uh, sentence of Bachelard, who said that uh, les, les instruments sont des théories matérialisées, instruments are reif reified theories. And if you think of the ways of reifying uh, theories before computers, that now seem to be the most easy way to do that, you can think of many things. We can even think of optics, because in some sense, uh, just an optical lens is performing a Fourier transform. But you can think of mechanical approaches, electromechanical approaches, and acoustical. For instance, for mechanical approaches, you have uh, the work which was done by uh, Lord Kelvin, and this was a huge machine for predicting and analyzing and citadizing uh, waveform related to tides. It was interested in predicting tides. And you have each of these pieces is just computing mechanically with an extremely uh, clever device made of spheres and cylinders uh, rolling on a plate, an integration, which is an integration after the multiplication by a given sine or cosine function, we just compute a coefficient of the Fourier decomposition. And then the largest one, I think, had 11 uh, elements in the decomposition. Okay, this was one way of computing a Fourier transform in the late, uh, in, in, in by the end of the 19th century. And uh, later you had the electromechanical uh, approach, I will come back to this, but also you can think of acoustical approaches. And this is, this is precisely with these acoustical approaches that the second name of the title come into the play, because we just arrived to a guy whose name is Rudolf Koenig, I guess you, you know Rudolf Koenig. And Rudolf Koenig was uh, somebody who came from Prussia to France, and he arrived when he was 20 or something like this, and then he established it in Paris, and he was a very famous acoustician of his times. And he wrote a lot of papers, really as a scientist, scientific papers, I would say peer-reviewed papers, and also he wrote a comprehensive memoir in uh, 1882, which is a big thing, which summarizes most of the uh, theoretical ideas he had on many problems in acoustics, and especially he was interested in stu studying phenomena like beating phenomena, composition of acoustic waves and things like this. But not only was a theoretician, but also he was an expert builder of scientific instruments. And he was renowned for that. He was a specialist on many things, especially tuning forks. And also he was the inventor of the so-called manometric flames. And this was only some of the many inventions he made, because if you look at the catalog he had, because he was selling, of course, his products, uh, you have 272 items in the catalog of 80, 80, 1882, which is quite big. It's interesting to have a look at this catalog, because you really have, a, uh, I will give the reference at the end, you have really have a lot of different devices which are extremely clever. So, I, I was talking about manometric flames, so what are manometric flames? That's a device like this, you have a capsule here, here in this small room, you have a membrane, okay? 
And you have here one way of en making entering some gas, okay, for when uh, for getting a flame from this gas. And on the other uh, side of the capsule, you have something like a horn, and you can of course say anything you want, put any, any kind of uh, acoustic waveform, and then you will get a modulation here, a vibration of the diaphragm within the capsule, and this modulation will make a modulation of the flame, and then, because everything is going quite fast, you have a rotating mirror which acts like a stroboscope, and here you have a crank, you have to really to, to turn this, and then you project or you look at the, uh, what is here and you take photographs or graphic or presentation and you get things like this. And these are all uh, diagrams obtained from the manometric flames corresponding to vowels. And uh, Koenig was interesting with other people to have some kind of signature of what could be a vowel in, 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 in speech. And here, okay, you have a number of different notes here and uh, corris corresponding to different frequencies for the different vowels. And all the information is coded in the kind of periodicity or pseudo-periodicity you can get in the level of uh, the flame. Okay, so that was one of the first way of getting a picture of what could be a, a sound uh, here on by, by mean of, of a projection. And then if you think of this uh, manometric flame, of course it's something which is not selective in terms of frequency. But at the same time, there had been studies made by another uh, researcher, which is Helmholtz, and Helmholtz in particular developed some ideas of resonators and resonators which can be tuned to given frequencies. And what Koenig did was indeed the very first time frequency analyzer. Because he was doing Fourier analysis without quoting Fourier, without saying that he was doing Fourier analysis, but this, this was really this, because he had a bunch of different resonators, okay? And at the output of these resonators, you had the previous device with the manometric flames. Which means that when you get now a larger mirror here and you look at what happens, you get here a frequency axis, as, as a function of time, you can see what kind of frequency is preferably um, uh, uh, in, present in, in the signal at a given time. So here, of course, you have some kind of some, a choice of a filter bank here with the different resonators, and you do not see the flame. Well, if you go to, on the web and you have many uh, uh, videos uh, of people who are uh, actually using this system and you can see what happens in terms of a, a kind of a movie, which is uh, a time frequency analysis. Okay, so now, of course, I was mentioning uh, some avatars of this kind of technique and among them uh, there is one which is extremely similar in the spirit, except that rather than using uh, acoustics, you are, you are using directly some uh, electromechanical system, and which is a sonograph. And it's funny, that's also another Koenig who derived the, the sonograph. That's not the same because it was uh, uh, 80 years later, okay? But you have the same kind of idea because you just replace the different resonators by uh, uh, different filters, which are only one filter which is uh, varied by uh, an heterodyne frequency analyzer here, but when the recording on the turntable is playing again and again and again, then you have the different filters which are uh, used, and then you have on this electrosensible paper some mark with a stylus which gives you the image of your sound, and this is what had become uh, uh, the so-called visible speech with the book of Potter and collaborators, which have been some kind of uh, very new way of seeing uh, what uh, speech could look like, and not only really speech, but also bird songs and so on and so forth. So now, if you think of the approach by Koenig, and if you connect the approach by Koenig with the ideas of Helmholtz, you can say that there is some inspiration from the hearing system in the sense that you will have uh, a cochlear-like 
filter bank. So you consider the different filters a little bit like the decomposition, which is at the level of the processed input by the cochlea. But you can also think a little bit ahead and, and think about the raw signal, because uh, first, before being dispersed by the cochlea, then you have just a waveform which is impinging on the eardrum, and you can think of mimicking what is received by the eardrum and make use of this for having another form of drawing uh, for, for a speech signal or for uh, audio signals. And this is where the third person of this talk comes into the play, which is Edouard Léon Scott de Martinville. And Edouard Léon Scott de Martinville was first an editor. And he was working for a scientific publication, but he was a typographer and especially was interested in stenography, the way of having a graphic description of what is said. Okay. And at the same time, he was an inventor. And as an inventor, precisely because of his practice of stenography, he wanted to go beyond state of the art, the current limitation of stenography. And in one of his uh, uh, writings, he said that one day he had this imprudent idea of photographing the world. And this was really what he wanted to do. He wanted to get in some kind of more objective way a photography of a world which could be used as a signature of uh, uh, what is not only the meaning of the world but also the intonation and the, and the, uh, the phrasing and the way it is really pronounced. But at the same time, he was an outsider as compared to other scientists not speaking of Fourier, but also of, uh, of Koenig. And so he had limited interaction with academia, which was kind of a, a problem. And in some sense, and we'll show later, he had been shadowed by other people. Okay, so if you look at uh, Scott's agenda in 1857, uh, uh, he submitted a document to the French Academy of Science, where he said that, y a-t-il une possibilité d'arriver telle la photographie, which is just this, is there a possibility of reaching, in the case of sound, a result analogous to that attained at present for light by photographic processes? Can one hope that the day is near where the musical phrase escaped from the singer's lips will be written by itself and as if without the musician's knowledge on a docile paper and leave an imperishable trace of those fugitive melodies which the memory no longer finds when it seeks them? Will one be able to have placed between two men brought together in a silent room an automatic stenographer that preserves the discussion in its minutest details while adapting to the speed of the conversation? Will one be able to preserve for the future generation some features of the diction of one of those eminent actors, those grand artists who die without leaving behind them the faintest trace of their genius? So this is quite a program. So this is exactly what he wanted to do. And for doing that, he precisely processed by trying to mimic uh, what, what is going on in the hearing system at the eardrum level. And in the early attempts, which were in the mid-19th uh, century, the system was quite uh, elementary because it was exactly that. You had a horn, and so you were speaking in a horn. Then you had a membrane, which is vibrating, corresponding to the vibration received by, by it. And at the output uh, uh, here, um, linked to this membrane, you have a stylus, okay? And then you have a lump black plate, and the lump black plate is just moved like this, and then depending on the vibration received by the membrane, as transcribed by the stylus, you get some figures. Okay, so first results were like this. So in some sense, it calls for improvements because it's nice. Uh, here is written by uh, Scott, parole, and here, the guitar, okay? Um, uh, premiers essais de fixation d'un son remontant à trois années exécuté sans aucun instrument. So, first uh, trials to, to fix a sound three years later, uh, before, th that was when he submitted this uh, uh, to the French Academy of Science, uh, just by means of his. So, it looks more like uh, Cy Twombly's uh, uh, design drawing than a real sound, so it's not that easy, but there is something. And so, since there is something, and it seems not to be necessarily something hopeless, 
Then he called for some advice, and he went to Koenig, Rudolf Koenig, who we saw before, and he started a collaboration with Koenig. And the collaboration was both good and not so good. First, it was good because they really created now a better device, which was called the phonotograph. And the phonotograph dates back 1859, and is essentially a barrel. Here, you are speaking by here, then you have the membrane, the stylus, and yet then you replace the plate by a cylinder, rotating cylinder, and because in the rotation, the, rot the cylinder is, is moving uh, in this direction, you get a, a much longer uh, tracing, which is just enrolled on, on, on the cylinder. Okay, and uh, what Koenig did was really to manufacture something which was a good, device. And also, he put some uh, interesting improvements. For instance, he had this idea, because of the rotation, which was a manual rotation, he put the idea of recording at the same time something coming from a tuning fork. You knew exactly what was the regularity of the tuning fork and the oscillations, and then afterwards you can compensate, and you can do some, uh, some time warping, which is just for an adjustment in terms of the analysis, if necessary. And here is an example where you have the tuning fork here, signature, and here you have some, some signal coming from, uh, from, uh, from some speech. And then, almost immediately, Koenig, who was really much more a businessman as uh, uh, Scott was, obtained the exclusive license to manufacture the phonotographs and to use them and sold them for scientific instruments. So he constructed dozens of those instruments that, that were in different parts of the world for people really interested in what we call scientific experiments. Whereas Scott was not in this business. He was interested really in what he called looking for words that wrote themselves. So he was really wanted, wanting to do something which was radically different from a more classical scientific uh, approach, which was more uh, some kind of direct signature of what it, uh, in, in the spirit of stenography. And so if you want to make a parallel, here is, for instance, some work used by, uh, done by uh, Schneebeli uh, a little bit later, 10 years later. Uh, more than 10 years later, for studying again vowels by means of the uh, phonotograph. And this was really studying some shape of these waveforms that was expected to give some hints about the structure of the walls. Where I, if you think of uh, uh, Scott's approach, it was much more qualitative, and he, he was trying to reading directly some, some, some graphs. And if you in, enlarge, for instance, this, for instance, uh, here, he was trying to build some kind of dictionary. In modern terms, you would speak of, uh, I don't know, when you construct a dictionary for a matching pursuit or something like this, you can put some sine waves, different frequencies, which is called here, voix grave, voix aiguë, and here you have a chirp, one voix aiguë descendant au grave from a high frequency to low frequency or from low frequency to high frequency. You have amplitude modulation and you have a low level and you have a number of harmonics for the timbre and you have different things which are plosives and things like this. So he was trying to categorize some kind of a dictionary, made a very simple waveform, but after that he wanted to go further. And he wanted really to see something which was corresponding to an intonation. And uh, he was trying to do no lion du désert, sous le rentre bruyant, and so on and so forth. And, and th this was something which was really going too far for many people, and it, for him it was a, a dead end. So, he had some contacts with academia, as told. First, he had contact with Jules Antoine Lissajou, who is well known for the combination of different uh, uh, waveforms, the figure de Lissajou. Okay, and at the beginning, Lussajou was very supportive of Scott, and he even uh, supported Scott for uh, going to the, um, to, uh, with, with Koenig, but after that, he considered it was just uh, a bad way. And Etienne Jules Marais, the inventor of the chronophotograph, for instance, was even more uh, severe, because he said that l'insuccès fut complet, which is, uh, this was a total failure. And so, 
Scott tried a little bit to do more, and first, uh, I told you that he had submitted a sealed manuscript on the principle of photography to the French Academy of Science, which was a way of getting f a recognition, of, well, g getting a date for, a, for an invention. But so, when he saw the way where, where the things were going on in 1861, when he split with Koenig, he asked for the opening, and at the same time, to make public the, di the discovery, and at the same time, he deposited several examples of recordings. And then he just quitted, he had a new life, he gave up photography, and he went back to, to uh, typography and bibliophilia and things like this, until 1877, where Edison's photograph popped up. And at, the same, at that time, he was very upset because nobody was referring to the idea of uh, Scott when talking about Edison. Of course, Edison was able to reproduce the sound, which uh, well, Scott was not able to do. And so he wrote a new book, Le Problème de la Parole s'écrivain, The Problem of the Speech Writing in it's Itself, that was an ultimate try to get credit for his key role, and he, he died one year later. So nevertheless, if we go back to the recording that he deposited, it was not so bad because Thanks to Koenig, you had some pretty neat tracings. And in particular, on April 9, 1860, there was this famous recording of a song, Au clair de la lune, under the moonlight, which was the first ever recording of a human voice. And it was 17 years before Edison. But this was completely forgotten. This was in a drawer in the French Academy of Science, and that's it. Except that, Clever people, David Giovannoni and Patrick Pfister, in 2008, went to the French Academy, asked the permission for scanning the recording of Scott in Paris, and then went back to the US, where they digitized the sounds, and then they made some restoration. Because after all, you had this tracing, and this tracing is just kind of a photograph of a waveform like an oscilloscope. And it's easy in the principle, not so easy uh, practically, but anyway, to get the whole waveform. And this is this kind of thing with an enlargement of one part. And when precisely you go, you do this and you play, you hear. Okay, that's not perfect, but anyway, that's Scott's voice singing Au clair de la lune. Au clair de la lune, mon ami Pierrot, for French people. Uh, I think it was recognizable. Okay, and that's really impressive because that's the first human voice ever recorded. The interesting thing is that, uh, of course, uh, this was big buzz cover of the New York Times and things like this. But, but we can also think of uh, what uh, this may us think of in more modern terms. Because uh, I, I was referring to Fourier, to Koenig, to Scott, and with Fourier you always have this problem of uh, modes uh, which are in between physics and mathematics, which was one of the problematics of, uh, of Fourier himself. But you can think of are there really physical quantities or just uh, clever mathematical representation? Which is an issue which, which comes naturally, for instance, when we, you switch from stationary situation to non-stationary situation, where Fourier modes are really uh, good from a mathematical point of view, but not really for describing the ultimate uh, structure of a signal. For Koenig, that's a little bit the same because uh, it was first transforming the sound before doing something else. And for Scott, it was this idea of directly jumping on the waveform rather than doing something analogous to the filter bank of, of, of the hearing system. And uh, if we think of Fourier, when I say that are mode physical or only mathematical, then you go to uh, problems which were precisely discussed 20 years before, uh, after Fourier theory and uh, 20 years before 
the decomposition done by the by the uh, devices of uh, Koenig, for instance, and it start with Helmholtz. But there is a home who played a role in this, and he had a dispute with a guy named Sibek, and Holm has given his name to a famous Holm's law in electricity, but also to a Holm's law in acoustics, where he was really one. Uh, he wanted really to prove that uh, he, he was trying to find the definition of a tone. What is a tone and how the tone can be defined with or without the use of sine waves and is it composed of, of different uh, sine waves. And so he, he made a number of experiments and a number of claims and unfortunately he made some mistakes in some calculation and, and the dispute was not really uh, successful because uh, Seebeck uh, died shortly after and the debate was closed without really uh, saying something about the existence of, objective existence of tones composing more complex uh, waveforms in an independent way I would say as in the Fourier analysis, because the question was, are the different tones independent or interacting? And so uh, this is a debate which happened in the mid uh, in 19th century, but this is something which surfaced again also in the 20th century, because I didn't quote here um, debates which have uh, a place stick took place in, uh, in quantum mechanics, for instance, where the, the issue was also to give or not an existence to Fourier modes when describing, uh, when describing wave functions, for instance. And if we think of this in, in more uh, recent terms, you can final, finally ask to, uh, the question of should we stick to a Fourier decomposition when we want to think of oscillation in some sense, and, or should we do something else? And so, for instance, you can go to something which could be dictionary learning. So given some waveform, you try to infer some natural constituent which adequately, maybe in a sparse way, describe what you are observing. And then you can do that in a data-driven uh, way. And for instance, I refer here to a, um, a current of studies which we have seen in the last 20 years, which is the empirical mode decomposition, where we, the idea is much more to think in terms of oscillations rather than in terms of Fourier modes. Because what is more important, and this was the kind of thing which was discussed in the experiments of Holm with the siren, where the, uh, the, s the signals were, where uh, the tone was described much more by time interval in between characteristic uh, points, like, uh, for instance, you have a hole in a, in a rotating drum and no sign as, as such, but you create something with a given frequency. And so you, you decompose in terms of oscillation rather than in terms of harmonic uh, oscillations. Okay? And this is an example, for instance, of a very uh, uh, toy signal where you have three different modes in some sense, which are sparsely described by this type of this description because here you have something which is highly nonlinear, which is just a triangular. Here you have a damped sinusoid and here you have an increasing triangular waveform as well. And so when you superpose this, you get this kind of signal. But with this idea that you are mostly interested in intervals between characteristic points rather than a complete sinusoidal waveform like in Fourier, you can get a much more compact description when analyzing this because the result of this decomposition is just these three modes, okay? And so th this is something which rings a bell in this direction and I think it would be interesting to go further and to, to think a little bit more in terms of uh, why these very empirical methods might have some interest with respect to specific structure, like for instance the, the, the hearing system. And, and this, precisely, this is interesting to see that uh, this gives a new way of looking at the beating effect. Because if you think of the beating effect, this is a kind of experiment that Cunning made with uh, tuning forks, where depending on whether the frequencies are close or, uh, or, or, or more loosely uh, spaced, you have something which looks like either one frequency with a modulation or a superposition of different frequencies that just go back, goes back to 
to the classical problem, which is if this plus this is equal to this multiplied by that, the truth, the physical truth, uh, uh, the mathematical truth has no reason to be um, at the left or at the right. You can have equally well this, these two interpretations. But of course, when you have this description on the left, it's because you consider that you have two tones, okay? And on the, on the right, that's a little bit different because you can consider that you have one tone multiplied by something which plays the role of a low frequency envelope, okay? And that, that's physics versus mathematics. That's two different ways of, of uh, seeing the same thing. And amazingly, when you look at uh, the empirical mode decomposition, and you look at something, which is a very simple model for this, where you had even one extra degree of freedom, which is the amplitudes here. Everything has been showed in this problem to only depend on the ratio of the amplitude and the ratio of the frequencies. And when you look at a criterion where you want to decide whether you are extracting or not the highest frequency component, um, for instance, by means of this technique, you see that you have a very, very uh, structured phase transition which tells you that this is not the same depending on whether the ratio in between the amplitude is larger or smaller for higher fre or, or, uh, frequencies or, 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 or low frequencies. And here you have a very regular curve on this half, but here you have something which has a more sharp structure and you have no symmetry. And so, in some sense, because you, you have a data-driven representation, you let the, the representation decide what is best considering the way that this composition is done. So what is the a priori? That the a priori that everything is controlled not by a model which would be made of sine and cosine, but by something which reveal an oscillation in terms of intervals between uh, characteristic points. Okay, I could comment on this if you're interested. Now, uh, back to, to Koenig, I, I told that uh, the sound analyzer of Koenig was a time frequency analyzer indeed, because it was really looking at the temporal output of a logarithmic filter bank because of the size of the, of the different uh, Helmholtz resonator. So, in modern term, it would be something like a spectral-like image, maybe on a male scale or something like this for feature extraction. And this is common practice because you do not start uh, very often, you do not start directly with a signal. You first transform it from the signal to a time frequency plane. So this is uh, Au Claire de la Lune. This is a time frequency analysis of uh, the spectrogram of uh, Au Claire de la Lune. And then on given time span, windows, uh, you get some features, and from these features, you can expect to do some kind of classification, recognition, uh, comparison, every, everything you want. And this is, in some sense, the, I would say, classical idea of pre-processing for doing uh, future processing. But now, if you go to Scott, Scott is different, because precisely Scott wanted to read words that write themselves. So it directly wanted to get the information from the waveform as supposed to be recorded. I'm almost done. And so this rings the bell of what about using the raw signal as an input, for instance, of a CNN. And this is something which has been investigated uh, in your community, and I'm sure and I've seen that there are, the pa there are papers dealing with this uh, uh, in the coming days. I'm interested to look at this. And this kind of end-to-end -end learning could be one different way, which would be kind of a revival of uh, Scott's ideas compared to other ideas. And for instance, here, this is an except that uh, comes from, from this paper, where there, there is a reorganization when you look at the way of the different uh, layers of uh, CNN are organized, which recover in some sense precisely the kind of male scale of the filters you have in more classical, uh, more classical system. Thanks to Manuel Musalam for having showed me this in the summer school, and uh, it was very instructive. Okay, so to conclude, uh, I started with Fourier, and Fourier, uh, this is one of the, as I told you, a giant of science, technology, and humanity, I would say, in general. So Fourier is uh, at the Commemoration Nationale this year, and this was one uh, 
opportunity to celebrate uh, uh, foyer. So if you are interested, uh, there are many, many events related to uh, this birthday of foyer everywhere, all over France, but not only. And if you are interested, uh, there is a, a, this website, uh, completely updated, regularly updated list of events of what is going on, what happened, and some archives and some uh, materials related to, to Fourier. Concerning Koenigs, if you are interested in the experiments and catalog of Koenig, everything is online on uh, Gallica. So you can go to gallica.bnf.fr and then you ask for Koenig, Rudolf Koenig, and you can get big books. Uh, which are interesting. I, I would encourage you to browse the catalog because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's fun. If you want to know more about Scott de Martinville, there had been a special uh, day session at the French Academy of Science uh, one year and a half ago. And uh, we had uh, a number of uh, talks, including by David Giovannoni, who was the guy who did the restoration and uh, the, uh, made possible to hear the voice of Scott de Martinville, and also there was one of the grand grandson of uh, Scott de Martinville who was there. And if you want to hear Scott's recordings, everything is on firstsounds.org, and then you can, you can, in this case, hear other things, not only Au Clair de la Lune, you can think, uh, hear some experiments, like, for instance, uh, tuning forks before and after some restoration. after some restoration. You can also hear a male voice. And you can also hear some uh, opera songs and uh, baritones and also some guy singing a song I didn't knew, which was, which is fly little bee fly, which is one way of Okay, so go to, uh, go to uh, First Sounds org site and uh, you have plenty of information. I think it was, well, just to conclude, I, I think it was first interesting to give a tribute to, to some not so well-known people like Koenig, ignored people like Scott de Martinville, and of course to known people like Fourier, and to see how they're, they're, that's not f necessarily easy to, to see connections on how all those people were somehow interested in, in the same things, but not at the same time exactly with the same ideas of they wanted to do, uh, ultimately may converge now and may also ring some bell about uh, techniques we are interested in, but that, that was a matter also of time passing and history, and uh, this was one of the message of this talk. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Patrick. So I think you can take questions, right? So we are not in a hurry in having uh, many oral presentations in a row. So we have time for questions. So please raise your hand, and there are microphones in the room if you want to ask questions. Patrick, yes. Um, on speech, on speech examples, can you understand what is said when when you listen to the recordings? Sorry. Can you can you understand what 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 is really said? Well, it's difficult because uh, I, I must confess that in 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 some cases um, you ha we had the text and given the text you can uh, you can uh, okay try to recognize and especially because some of the the, the things which were, well, that's maybe also uh, a way of thinking of Scott, because, okay, he didn't make, very often what we do is to start with simple things, 
and then we, we go to more complicated things. But in this case, he, he was recording text for very obscure uh, um, um, uh, well, very emphatic claims of uh, theatric, theatrical, theatrical uh, in, in, some, in some plays which are even difficult to read when you read the text. So it's, all, it's not that easy. And some of them are in Italian, some of them are in other languages. So he documented everything. So when you have the text and you hear, then you can, you can make the, the connection. But except for Au Claire de la Lune, I, I guess that everybody, everybody would have recognized Au Claire de la Lune. Or also for um, da, 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 everybody can recognize what is going on. Otherwise, no. <laughs> No, I think uh, it was also, well, the, it was not for that that uh, the, the invention of Scott just uh, remained uh, unknown because there were, there were no ways of getting this information before uh, the 2008. So in the 90s, it just disappeared and was shadowed by Edison's invention because Edison's invention precisely Okay, it took a lot of things from the idea of Scott for recording, but also he had this idea of uh, inscripting so that you can do the reverse process. And, and you said that you, you had uh, recordings of uh, opera singing? Yes. But is there recordings of other uh, music, other instruments? And, uh well, some instruments, there are some uh, guitars, there are some trombone, uh, trombone, yes. And uh, I think that's it. Uh, at least for what is online on firstsounds.org, and um, but we we can go and check what is uh, the total uh, well because there's a finite number of recordings which are not that many because he did that and uh, then he decided to make this public in his second uh, sending to the academy and there were a number of examples supposed to be the best examples but of course no electric guitar. <laughs> Is there any question? Yes. Um, thank you for your very interesting talk. I'm, I was interested in the difference of approach between Scott and uh, uh, Edison uh, because you, you said that uh, uh, Scott was more interested in doing some drawings, analysis, and uh, Edison analysis and then being able to resynthesize. Is it what made uh, Edison more uh, efficient in solving his problem? Or was there a really a different technical approach or materials that were available uh, for Edison and not for Scott? So what was the difference uh, no, that I made Edison more uh, efficient in solving the problem? Yeah, no, I, I think definitely uh, what, make, what made the difference for Edison is that you were able to record and then to replay, and you, you were hearing what was going on, and, and there was an evidence that the job was done. You, you had really uh, uh, engraved the voice, and then you can really re understood understand the, the, the voice. Whereas with Scott, the problem is that he has so many different drawings of the same sound, even with the same uh, person, that you, 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 can, you can see that it's, very, it's not very robust, the way of, uh, of, doing, uh, of doing this. And so when he tried to uh, use the waveform as a stenography, this was a failure. Okay, because what the hope of Scott was that rather than inventing a stenography as people were doing with some signs for some sounds, this will naturally come from the writing of the waveform by the stylus. That's the purpose of the words that write themselves. And this is not true. And so for, for that, nobody, even Scott, was really able, looking at a recording in terms of a tracing on, a, on, 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 a, on this uh, uh, on the black lamp plate to read the world. So it's it's very difficult to uh, it's it's almost impossible. And now it would be the same even with a good recording technique. And uh, I I don't know maybe there are people 
I know that there were people able to read spectrograms, but reading waveforms directly and looking at the waveform, considering they, this as a stenographic writing for storing uh, the information and the message, uh, I, I think it's, it's not the, the right. But Scott clearly stated, in his, even in the last book he wrote one year before he died, that he was not at all interested in Edison's program. He was, he, he was saying, I'm not interested in replaying uh, the, the voice. I'm interested in a graphical system which would write the words. Top. But I think he was also a, a little bit bitter because he, he was really in his track and with his idea of what sh should be done and nobody was following him and he thought that he was not recognized even for what he did. So, and, and it's true because he, he was not recognized for what he wanted to do, that's one point. But that people just ignore the fact that the phonograph for this type of engraving in some way or writing some, some uh, speech was uh, some form of precursor for the phonograph is a little bit unfair. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the talk. Uh, I was wondering uh, when uh, Scott de Martinville derived his uh, kind of dictionary by hand, did he have in mind a, a kind of rationale like, uh, like sparsity <laughs> for designing his dictionary or what was, uh, did he make some assumption on how the speech was made? He didn't explain that. He didn't explain that. We had, uh, the only notes we have are the, the first manuscript where it described, and you have seen the kind of terms that he's using for this agenda. That's not exactly a, a scientific paper. And, and then he had a bunch of examples. And then when he came back, uh, the, second, uh, the second sending to the French Academy in 61 was only please open the previous one to make it public, and then here are some more examples. I'll show you examples. And then we have to wait for the very final book, which is not exactly a book, which is more... You, you, well, this is an old man who is extremely bitter about not having been recognized for what he did, and almost all what he's saying is... Uh, this is not true, this is unfair. If I had been rich and if I had been introduced correctly, uh, knowing people, the academia then, and so on and so forth, which was partly true, but uh, that, that, that was not really an explanation. He didn't try to convince more by some form of, of scientific argumentation. And I think this is also one of the reasons why Koenig, Dissajou, and other people didn't want to uh, uh, to go along with him because uh, they were not in the same world, not in terms of uh, social world and uh, professional world, but I mean intellectual world, they, they were not following the same track. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Thank you. Okay, so um, now we are going, uh, we, we will take um, one or two minutes to set up the next oral session. And uh, for those also who have not, those presenters who have not checked the presentation, they can do it very rapidly to see if it's on, it's on the computer. And otherwise, we'll start the session right away. And uh, um, so um, you have one, two minutes just to check your presentation. And then we are going to uh, launch the presentation. It will be chaired by Anja Volk. And uh, the first speaker, uh, I hope, is ready. So you can use this one. Mathieu? On commence pas direct? 
Ok. Comment So it's what's number six? Number six. Uh, so I have both the new PowerPoint and the old PowerPoint.